child some other had pneumonia, okay. The whole children's home, but COVID's going through that, man. Okay, any other prayer requests tonight? Anybody else? Um, Father, we just lift this up to you right now. Thank you, Lord. We pray your shield over these precious children. We just ask your strength and your healing power, your immune system, their immune systems to be strengthened with your strength. Shield them, Lord, we pray, and give them wisdom there, Lord. Give them grace there, Father. Ask it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Praise God. Well, can I ask you for an SOS? Uh, could you scoot over some toward the middle here? <clears throat> it'll, it'll save save me. I, I preach longer when you're spread out like that. So if you just kind of move toward the middle, it, it really shortens things down a lot. For those of you that are already here, you could just kind of move this way a little bit if you're comfortable to do that. Thank you so much. And can I get a couple of guys to just set this right down here for me, please? I got the bench here just in case my back gets to giving me some problems. I, <clears throat> I preached a couple of weeks ago and stayed on my feet the whole time. Just bring it right on down there, guys, if you would. Thank you. Appreciate it. And I'll just set this little guy over here in case I need it. Maybe I won't. Hopefully I won't. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you that we're here tonight. We thank you that you're here tonight, most of all. We know it's not by might or power. It's by your spirit, and your anointing destroys the yoke. And we heard it quoted tonight, where two or three are gathered in your name, you are in the midst. So how many is glad Jesus is in the midst? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, I'm gonna, I want to do something that, uh, that uh, some of you have heard some of these things before, but I'm kind of following after my mentor, Jesus. He said, again, I say unto you. So some of the things you've already heard, we're going to say unto you. And Peter said it this way. He said, you already know this, but I'm going to stir up your pure heart by reminding you. How many knows you need to get reminded sometimes? So I want to remind us tonight. Uh, let's look at the first scripture here. And then uh, this is the only one that I've given and Andrea up there. So. We'll put this one up, and then if she can throw some of the other ones up as I go along. I told her, please don't feel any pressure. Uh, I may just be going so fast uh, that she won't be able to get them up. But she's really good, so I'm sure she can get some of them up. And it's not a big deal if, if they don't get up there, okay? Acts 26, 18. Now, this is the description of an unbeliever. They're to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive what? Forgiveness of sins. How many has been forgiven of sins? Hallelujah. Man, that'll, that'll make a Methodist shout. Amen. Forgiven. Forgiven. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. Hallelujah. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. Look over somebody if you are and say, I'm forgiven. Man, that means I'm released. That means it's in the past. It's gone. It's done. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance. So unbelievers are in darkness. Unbelievers are bound by the power of Satan, right? Unbelievers need to receive forgiveness and unbelievers do not have an inheritance among those that are sanctified. Hallelujah. Man, we've got an inheritance. Inheritance. Now, if somebody called you up and they said, guess what? Somebody you don't even know left you $10 million tax-free. That's right. That's what you would do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But when we say we've got an inheritance where we're going to heaven and not going to hell, we say, how long is he going to preach? Listen, you can leave any time you need to leave, okay? 
We are forgiven. We have an inheritance. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Now, I believe that according to the Word of God, we need to have an eternal perspective. We need to look at the things that are not seen and not just the things that are seen. I can't see heaven. I hear a I read a description of it in the Bible. I can't see hell. There are some people that say they have gone there. I can't, I've never seen hell, but I see the description of it in the Bible. That is something unseen. It's unseen. Uh, the, the life hereafter is unseen for the most part. We don't see things that are in heaven or things that are in hell for the most part. We see things here on earth. We see things with an earthly perspective. We, we judge things with an earthly perspective. But God sees things with an eternal perspective. And I believe and I pray for me. I hope you believe this too. I hope you want this too. That God will give you an eternal perspective. In other words, see things through God's eyes. See things uh, that are not. See things that you can't see with your natural eyes. But that you can see and discern with your spirit and from the word of God. I want an eternal perspective perspective. Your, your priorities will be determined by your eternal perspective. Your priorities, my priorities will be determined and be shown by an eternal perspective. If I have an eternal perspective and it's proper, a proper eternal perspective, then it's going to show in my behavior. It's going to show in what I do and what I don't do. And it's going to show in how I reach out to other people. If I have an eternal perspective, if I see someone and I know that they are not living for God, I know that they're probably on their way to eternal separation from God, if I have an eternal perspective, then I'm going to see that and say, I at least will pray for them. I pray that somebody will come across their path. I pray that God will send laborers to them. If we have an eternal perspective, we will reach out to those who are lost. Amen. If, if, if we meditate on, on where the lost are going, it will motivate us to reach out to them. Heaven is eternal. Hell is eternal. What you do for Jesus is eternal. What I do for Jesus, it's eternal. It's going to last forever. Hallelujah. What you do for Jesus is going to last. You remember that old song? Only what you do for Christ will last. Remember, only what you do for Christ will last. Only what you do for Him will be counted in the end. Only what you do for Him will last. Only what you do for Jesus, right? Amen. Now, I want to talk to you. Just Can I do a little bit of a teaching session here tonight? Just a little bit. The Bible talks about in Acts 20, 27, Paul said, I have not shunned to declare to you the what? Whole counsel of God. Somebody say it. Whole counsel of God. 2 Timothy 2, 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, so we've got the whole counsel of God. And then we've got scripture that says rightly divide the word of truth. That means you can divide it wrongly. That means that you can make decisions without the whole counsel of God. We have to take the whole counsel of God to come up with the right answer. Correct? So, listen at this. Now, think, think real hard with me right here, okay? Acts 16, 30 through 31. This is the Philippian jailer. After the earthquake and after the jail was open where Paul and Silas were imprisoned, 
The prison doors were open. The jailer runs in, and listen to what he says here. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So Paul and Silas said to him in verse 31, Acts 16, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And your household, if they believe as well. Not, it's not an automatic thing. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and what? You will be saved. Now listen to this in Luke 10, 25, there's a certain lawyer that stood up and tested Jesus, and he said, Jesus, now listen, he said, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Does that sound like the same question to you? What must I do to be saved? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why didn't Jesus just say to him, Believe on me and you will be saved? That's what we're going to look at tonight discerning who you're talking to, discerning the heart of the unbeliever will require a different approach. Okay? So what happened with the lawyer was, what happened with the lawyer, it says in verse 29, he wanting to justify himself. One version says he wanted to justify his lack of love for certain other people. In this case, it was the Samaritans. So in his mind, he's thinking, Jesus says, go to the law, and the law says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, your soul, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. In his mind, he's thinking, surely that Samaritan is not my neighbor. Surely he's not going to tell me to, 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 to love that man. But Jesus was saying that. Jesus sent this man to the law, whereas he told the uh, the Paul and Silas told the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we're going to try to look at tonight is the whole counsel of God, and we're specifically going to be talking about reaching people, touching people. Uh, Elijah said it tonight about the harvest that's coming. There's not going to be any harvest coming if we're just going to all sit around in a huddle and call plays. Can you imagine a football team just coming on the field? Say, you got 60,000 people out here, and these football players go, hey. They come out, and they, they okay, what's the play, man? Well, it's 47, uh, 32 to the, to the right side. And they all, they all get out of the huddle, and they clap their hands, and they stand around and say, ha, ha, man, that was a good huddle. What a call. Wow, what a call. Man, that was a call. No. I, I'm being a little... <laughs> Going a little too far with it, but have we not in the church got in the huddle, called the play, our pastor's up here calling the plays, and we say, man, that was a good sermon, and we do nothing with it. So if we're going to reach and have that harvest, now let me make a little statement here. I just... You know, you, you know, sometimes this stuff comes to your mind, and, you, and I, I write it out because, you know, I think, is this really, did I think what I think I thought I thought? And so I wrote it down, and here's what it is. I wrote this down. Prayer must be married to obedience. We pray for revival, and we don't obey God. We don't do what God tells us to do. You can pray until you're blue in the face. I'm not saying prayer is not effective. Prayer is effective. But prayer has got to be married to obedience. We have to say, God, do this, do this, do this, and Lord, use me if you care to use me. Send me. I'm willing to go. And then we do what he tells us to do. Whatever he says to you to do, do it. Don't think about it. Don't ask somebody else what they would do about it. If he says to you to do it, do it. Do it. So why are there two different answers to the same question? And here's the answer. The answer is there are two kinds of hearts mentioned here. One was a Philippian jailer who saw the power of God, and he humbled his heart, and he ran in and said, what do I need to do to be saved? I've seen, I've, this is not natural, this is supernatural. What must I do to be saved? He was already humbled. But the lawyer, asking the, basically the same question, he was testing Jesus. 
So Jesus says, you need to go to the law. So sometimes we have to discern what heart we are dealing with. The, the, in the scripture, the principle is this, law to the proud, grace to the humble. We're giving grace to everybody. And sometimes they're not, they don't feel any conviction. And I'm going to read you some things and to help back up what I'm saying here, okay? So let's look at this scripture. Let's get the whole counsel of God on a couple of scriptures here. Romans 2, 4, the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Is that true? Is it always true? The goodness of God, knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Do you know anybody that, that they have received the goodness of God, the goodness of God, the goodness of God, and they still spit in God's face? We had a, a man in our church uh, out in, uh, in Burleson where we pastored many, many, many years ago, and somebody put a hit on his life. He's driving down the road. He wouldn't ever go to church. He, his beautiful little wife came to church and taught our children. He didn't want to have anything to do with it. So he's driving down the road, and somebody put a hit on him. They rolled down his window, and boom, didn't kill him. Do you think that changed him? Don't you think he should have said, wow, God sure was merciful to me. I could be dead right now, but I'm not dead. Thank you, Lord, I will serve you. Didn't do it. Didn't touch him. Because, see, the heart has to be prepared with the law. And I'll get into that in just a moment before the gospel will be received. See, to you and me, when we talk about the cross of Jesus, I mean, it brings tears to our eyes. We know the suffering our precious Savior went through. It, it touches our heart. It moves us. It does something to us. But there's a lot of people you can talk about the cross. They could care less. Does it mean anything to them? Why does it not mean anything to them? Because their, their heart has not been humbled by the law. And I'll, I'll explain. Let me give you a couple of things here. Isaac Watts, July 1674 to the 25th of November 1748, an English Christian minister. Here's what he said. By the way, he was a hymn writer. He was credited with 750 hymns. He says, this verse, the goodness of God, is sandwiched between statements of God's judgment and God's wrath. So you got God's judgment, you got the goodness of God, and you got God's wrath. And we quote, the goodness of God will lead me to repentance, will lead them to repentance. But what about the judgment part? What about the wrath part? Doesn't it all go together? Okay, you're listening. Thank you. Listen to what he said. If Paul was saying we should preach only of God's goodness to sinners, he wasn't practicing what he preached. Now, this is a very insightful statement. I never knew but one person in the course of my whole ministry who acknowledged that the first motions of religion in his heart arose from a sense of the goodness of God, but I think all besides that one who have come within my notice rather have been first awakened to fly from the wrath of God through the passion of fear. Yeah, but God is love. Absolutely God is love. What's that got to do with what we're talking about tonight? Does God love sinners? Absolutely God loves sinners. Does God want everyone to be saved? It's not his will that any perish. But what we're talking about, church, is, is the harvest that we need to, we need to reach people. Man, I, I, was, uh, I, was, I won't go into all of it right now, but I got to looking at some in my notes. I found some places where I found some notes I had written of where children had been saved. And, and it talked about the fathers of the faith were saved nine years old, eight years old, 12 years old. I mean, we're talking about, you know, like Charles Finney and Charles Spurgeon and D.L. Moody and, and, and these men that shook the, the nation of their day. They 
were saved as children. So I just want to throw that in there for Royal Rangers or for girls ministry or for any other ministry that has to do with children. I want to throw it in there for our own children and our own grandchildren. When we're talking about a harvest, let's don't, let's don't forget that our children may need to be saved. Your grandchildren may need to be saved. If they're not, they do, right? So here's the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God is that when the heart is prepared, it's ready for the good news. If the heart is not prepared, the good news is... Is not really good news, it's just somebody's religion. If, if, I, if, if I, I go to the doctor and the doctor says, man, you are a sick man, you're not going to live 10 days, you're going to be dead in 10 days. And if he knew what he was talking about, if he said, you know, I've seen hundreds of patients with the same symptoms, every one of them died within two weeks. You've got probably 10 days left. What's going to happen? I'm going to go, this guy's got credentials. This guy knows what he's talking about. He says, I'm going to be dead in 10 days. And then just about the time the sweat beads out on my face, he says, but I've got good news. I say, what's the good news? He said, we've got a cure. We've got a cure. Works every single day time what happens to me I say quick give it to me see we we are presenting the good news to people that don't know that they're even lost hey we don't you think we live in a in a society now I mean I believe in the love of God I believe in the grace of God man if it wasn't for the love of God and the grace of God I wouldn't be here but let me tell you what there's more than just God God is more than just love there's the, there's the side that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. God, God's, God looks at, at people who are lost and, and who have rejected him. And, and, and yes, his heart breaks for them. But the way to reach them oftentimes is we have to bring and present the law. Now, let me, I, I know you're, you're listening. Let me, let me be sure I develop this enough. Here's what Jesus said. Luke 4:18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to who? The poor. You mean is that talking about somebody with a short bank account? No. He was anointed to preach the gospel to the the poor there means destitute and it means humble. The destitute and humble will receive the gospel. But those who are proud and arrogant who say, I don't need God, you can preach the cross to them all day long, and it's it's not going to affect them. They have to be awakened to their plight. Are you still there? They have to be awakened to their plight. Now, we don't do that with harshness. Now, you say, when you, you know, when you say something about presenting the law to people, people get in their mind, lay down the law to them. No, we're not talking about laying down the law and jumping on people and, and beating them up. We're not talking about that. We're talking about in a simple, loving, kind way, just saying, here's what. God's word says this is the whole counsel of God. Yes, he loves you. Yes, he died on the cross for you. But here's the whole counsel. There is a heaven and there is a hell. And we're all going to die one day. And when you die, where will you go? So Jesus said he's anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. Romans 7, 7, Paul said, I would never have had sin brought home to me but for the law. He said, I would never have felt guilty of sin of the sin of coveting if I had not heard in the law, thou shalt not covet. But when I heard that, I was awakened, I realized, oh, I am guilty. And that's when a 
lost person is ready for the gospel when they realize they are guilty. You have to, have to, they have to know they're guilty. Or they just, it won't have any effect on them. So, gospel to the poor. D.L. Moody said, if you have an unconverted person, convict them with the law. If you have a convicted person, convert them with the gospel. If they're already under conviction. See, there was a, a girl that Philip Yancey wrote one time, uh, What's So Amazing About Grace, in his book. A girl that was a prostitute that came to church. And this girl knew that she was in sin. She knew that she needed God. She didn't need for somebody to come up and say, Where are you? What are you doing in this place, you, you unclean woman? Who do you, you better get your act together because we, we don't take people like you in here. No, you don't approach a person like that who's already humbled, who already knows they're guilty, who already knows that they need a Savior. You don't jump on them and say, you did this and you did that and you're this and you're that. No, that's when you say, guess what? Come whosoever will, however you are right now, whosoever will, let him come and drink of the fountain of the water of life freely. You say that to somebody who's already humbled themselves. But I think, I think, and you, you theologians can correct me if I'm wrong, I think we are not seeing the results we need and want to see because we are preaching, a, we are preaching an easy Easy, get along with everybody type message. Nothing's wrong. <laughs> Maybe the last time I get to preach here, but thanks for, for being here tonight. No, everything, everything, it, there are some things that are wrong. Proverbs 6 talks about things that are wrong. The Ten Commandments talks about things that are wrong. See, that's, that's one thing about the Ten Commandments. You've heard your pastor preach it. The Ten Commandments are not something that, that are there so I can try to live up to it. The Ten Commandments are showing me that there's no way without God's help that I can do that. Matter of fact, I think it was D.L. Moody that said, said the, the law was presented, the law came about to be a mirror not to, not to, uh, the, it was a mirror to show us how much we needed God. The Ten Commandments, Proverbs 6, there's, there's a lot of them. 1 Corinthians 7, such were some of you, but now you're justified. Now you're sanctified. Hallelujah. I was this. So the whole point here, though, is if we're going to reach people, if we want to see the harvest, let's find out what works, right? See who you're dealing with. Charles Spurgeon, they called him the Prince of Preachers. I do not believe that any man can preach the gospel who does not preach the law. The law is the needle and cannot draw the silken thread of the gospel through a man's heart unless you first send the needle of the law to make a way for it. Lower the law and you dim the light by which the sinner perceives his guilt. This is a very serious loss to the sinner rather than a gain, for it lessens the likelihood of his conviction and his conversion. Again, I repeat, we're not being to be harsh with people, but we are not to withhold the medicine that will actually make an opening for them to receive the gospel. Now, back in Charles Spurgeon's day and Finney's day, Whenever there was a uh, hundred people converted, one year later, 80 of those converts were still serving God. You know what the average is today? If a hundred people are, quote, converted, it's about 20. Did you know the Assemblies of God did the decade of harvest thing here? And I don't know, it was, it was four or five hundred thousand people that, that they, they said that they got uh, cards on who who had come to the Lord, did you know, in, in just a couple of years, they could only find 12,000. 12, 
thousand out of five, four or five hundred thousand. Something happened there, didn't it? Were we sincere? Yes, we were sincere. Did, did we want to reach people? Yes, we wanted to reach people. All I'm saying tonight is let's find the best, let's find the method that Jesus used, let's find the method that Paul used, that these great soul winners used, and let's go out and let's win souls and, and draw people into Jesus. Amen? It's time to the church to win people to the Lord. Amen? A.B. Earl traveled by horseback 325,000 miles in the U.S. and Canada, either horseback or carriage. He died in 1895. He preached 19,780 times, and he saw 150,000 people converted in his meetings. Now, here's what he said. First of all, before I read the, the quote there, do you think somebody like that might ought to be worth listening to? Maybe they've learned something. 150,000 converts. Listen to this. A.B. Earl says, I have found by long experience that the severest threatenings of the law of God have a prominent place in leading men to Christ. They must see themselves lost before they will cry for mercy. They will not escape from danger until they see it. So if we rightly divide the word, if we give the whole counsel of God, the whole counsel of God is the gospel is powerful enough to save those who receive it. And those who receive it are those who know they need it. Their heart has been prepared. And what prepares their heart? It's the law of God spoken in love. See, I can go up to somebody and start talking to them, and I can just witness to them in a very loving way, and I can say, I can say, you know, I show them my little, my little track. That's kind of the way I start the conversation. I show them my little track, and I say, you know, in this picture right here, I was a liar. I was a thief. I was into all kind of things I shouldn't be into, and I'm ashamed of that. And and. I, I know I know that that was wrong, but God had mercy on me. I had to pray, and Mama, my Mama prayed, and the Lord had mercy on me. And I can just present the law to them, and say, you know, have have you ever stolen anything? Have you ever told a lie? Uh, are you living like God wants you to live right now? Well, no, I'm not. Or the other response might be, I'm as good as the next guy. Man told me that on the job one time. He, when we were by ourselves, he said, if that guy's a Christian, I ain't got nothing to worry about. Well, he was right. He was right. If that guy was a Christian, he had nothing to worry about from that guy. But he wasn't going to stand. That guy was going to stand on his own, and this man talking to me was going to stand on his own. Let me ask you this. If, if, if we were giving $10,000 for every lost person that you brought to church tonight, would there be anybody sitting beside you? I'd probably have a whole row of them, right? So that means, maybe, that means that we count $10,000 more important than we count eternity the eternal soul of someone who is lost. Now, let me say this, and this is a, this is a paradigm shift for me. I, we talk about bringing people to church, bringing people to church, bringing people to church. That's good. But you know what? What you need to do is you need to go out and be the church on your job, in your wherever you are, be the church. I, I, I preached a sermon one time at Gospel Lighthouse years ago, and I said, and it was titled, How to Get People to Church Without Ever Inviting Them. You know how you do that? You go out there and get them saved. And when they're really saved, they're going to want to, hey, where do you go to church? And they're going to come. See, we're, we're trying to get people into church. Now, listen, 
your pastors, your pastors are in place to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Your pastor is not supposed to be doing all, all of the soul winning. He can personally win souls himself, but as a pastor, he is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. You go out and get them. You, you say, God, give me the heart. That's what you got to have first. Get a heart. Get a burden. Get a heart that says, God, that person that I'm working with or this person here, they may be on their way to hell. Do you realize, man, this, this just blows me away. I know I'm, I'm kind of a, I get blown away a lot when I preach, right? This really, this is, what a thought this is, Brother Thurman. You have the potential to change someone's eternal destiny. Wow. Wow. You, I, we have the potential to change someone's eternal forever. When the Titanic was going down and they had put the lifeboats out, there was one lifeboat that was pretty full and there was a man, they said, trying to get into the lifeboat, but there was a woman with an oar and she was hitting his hands as he was trying to get out of the cold water to keep him out of getting in the boat because she was afraid, I guess, that he might sink the boat. So she's hitting his hands and evidently the man drowned and he was lost. Now, I don't think a whole lot of somebody like that, do you? But before we judge too, too harsh, think about this. She kept him out with an oar. We keep people out with our silence sometimes. She kept him out of the safety boat with an oar. We might be guilty of keeping them out with our silence. Brother Dennis, you trying to make me feel guilty? I'm just saying there are people dying. There are people dying. There are like 500 people that die somewhere in the world, 600 or 1,200, I forget what it is. Every second, people are dying and going into eternity. Do you, do you, in, is it not happening so fast with our society? Man, we need a move of God. We need to be able to, to reach people with the real Jesus Hello? The real Jesus. Not, not some Jesus who's a big Santa Claus and you can just kind of do what you want. I, I won't look. Oh, oh, that wasn't very nice, was it? No, 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 no. Jesus is not a big Santa Claus who just, I'm just going to let it slide this time. Well, People are getting bound and bound and bound and bound. The good news is this world is so crazy right now, it's ripe for revival. It's ripe. If we'll just say, God, put me, put in me the vision. I, I, I'm not... I'm not asking for my pastor's vision, for Ray's vision, for, for Pastor Angel's to have the vision. I'm saying, God, give me the vision. Give me the heart. Give me the compassion. Jesus, it said in Matthew 9, 36, he looked on the crowd and he said he had compassion on them. You know what that means? Some, someone said that means his heart, he, he literally heaved with heartbreak because he saw them as sheep having no shepherd. He saw them mangled and thrown to the ground, it says, 
in one version. God, give me compassion. Let me see through your eyes. Now, I know I can't reach everybody, but I can reach somebody. I know I can't win everybody, but I can witness and be a witness. I guess I'll close with this story. And I told it here four years ago, I think, and you probably heard it. Some of you heard it back then, and some of you, uh, some of you may have heard it somewhere else, or maybe you never heard it. I, I wasn't planning on doing this tonight, but man, this is a powerful way to end this time we've had together here. So, a woman in a Baptist church in London. She got up and told how she had gotten saved when she was visiting some relatives in Sydney, Australia. She said this little white-haired man stepped out of a doorway, gave her a pamphlet, and said, Excuse me, are you saved? If you died tonight, are you going to heaven? I was astonished by these words. Nobody had ever told me that. I thanked him courteously, and all the way home on British Airlines, this puzzled me. I called a friend who lives in the same area I'm living in now, and he was a Christian, and he led me to Christ, and now I'm a new Christian. So 10 days later, that same pastor who had heard that story went to a three-day series of meetings in a Baptist church. A woman came to him for counseling, and she said, I used to live in Sydney a couple of months back. I was visiting friends in Sydney, doing some last-minute shopping on George Street, a strange little white-haired elderly man stepped out of the shop doorway, handed me a pamphlet, and said, Excuse me, ma'am, are you saved? If you died tonight, would you go to heaven? She said, These words disturbed me when I got back. I went to a Baptist church on the next block from where I lived, sought the pastor out. He led me to Christ. So now this Baptist pastor has heard two stories within two weeks. Then he goes to preach at Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Perth, which is in Australia, I believe. And when his teaching service was over, the senior elder of the church took him out for a meal and said, and he said, uh, he asked him, said, how did you get saved to the elder? The elder said, well, I grew up in this church from the age of 15. I never really made a commitment to Jesus. But I was down in Australia, and I was down on George Street, and this little man stepped out of a doorway and handed me a track and said, excuse me, are you saved? He said, it really made me mad because I, I, was, a, I was an elder in the church for all these years, and it really made me mad. What do you mean am I saved? Of course, I'm a churchgoer. So he went back to his pastor, and he told the pastor the story, and the pastor said, I've been concerned about you for a long time. You're not saved. You need to get saved. So he gets saved. Okay, then, then we keep going with the story. Then the London preacher goes back to the UK. He was speaking at a convention where he mentioned these three testimonies. Now listen to this. At the close of his teaching, four elderly pastors came up and said, we got saved between 25 and 35 years ago through that little man on George Street giving us a track and asking us that question. Wow. So then the pastor flew back the following week to a convention in the Caribbean to the missionaries, to missionaries there, and he shared the testimonies at the closing of his teaching. Three missionaries came up and said, we got saved 15 to 25 years ago through that little man's testimony and asking us that question on George Street. Coming back to London, he stopped outside of Atlanta to speak at a naval chaplain's convention, this same pastor, where he preached on soul winning to 1,000 Navy chaplains. The, the chaplain general took him out for a meal. The pastor said, how did you become a Christian? He told him how he'd become a Christian. He said that... He was in the Navy, and he was down on George Street, and he said they were drinking and, and carousing. And he said, I got blind drunk. He said, I got off on the wrong bus on George Street. When I got off the bus, I thought it was a ghost, but this elderly white-haired man jumped in front of me, pushed a pamphlet in my head, hand and said, Sailor, are you saved if you die tonight or, you go to or will you go to heaven? He said, the fear of God hit me immediately. I was shocked, sober, ran back to the battleship, sought out the chaplain. The chaplain led me to Christ, and I soon began to prepare for the ministry under his guidance. And here I am today in charge of 1,000 
chaplains, and we are bent on soul winning. You got time for some more? The London preacher six months later flew to a convention of 5,000 Indian missionaries in a remote corner of northeastern India. At the end, the Indian missionary in charge took him to his home. The pastor said, how did you as a Hindu come to Christ? He said, I worked for the Indian diplomatic mission. I traveled the world, and I was just all over the place. He said, one day I went to Sydney. I was doing some last-minute shopping for my children. I was walking down George Street. A little white-haired man stepped out in front of me, offered me a pamphlet, and said, Excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you died tonight, are you going to heaven? I thanked him very much, but this disturbed me. I got back to my town. I sought out the Hindu priest who couldn't help me, but he gave me some advice. He said, Just to satisfy your curious mind, nothing else, go and talk to the missionary in the mission house at the end of the road, that was, a f that was fatal advice because that day the missionary led me to Christ. I quit Hinduism immediately, began to study for the ministry. I left the diplomatic service, and here I am, and by God's grace, in charge of all these missionaries. We're winning hundreds of thousands of people to Christ. Eight months later, in Guinea, the pastor was ministering. And he said to the host pastor, do you know an elderly little man who witnesses and hands out tracts on George Street? And the host pastor said, yes, I do. His name is Mr. Ginner, but I don't think he does it anymore. He's too frail and elderly. So the London pastor said, could we meet him? So later they went around to this little apartment, knocked on the door, and this tiny, frail little man opened the door. He sat them down and made them some tea. He was so frail that he was slopping tea in the saucer because he was shaking. As he sat with them, the London pastor told him all these accounts over the previous three years. This little man, Mr. Ginner, sat. With tears running down his cheeks. He said, when I got saved, I told God that I would try to witness to at least 10 people every day as long as he gave me the strength. He said, sometimes I couldn't do it. I, it wasn't anything I was paranoid about, but he said, I did this for over 40 years. And in my retirement years, the best place was George Street. I got lots of rejections, but a lot of people courteously took the tracks. Listen to this. In 40 years of doing this, I've never heard of one single person coming to Jesus until you told me today. 40 years. Someone calculated that it was over 100, about approximately 146,000 people that that little man somehow influenced to come to Jesus, and Mr. Ginner died two weeks later. Forty years, he never knew that even one soul had come to Jesus. You see, you don't know what seeds you're planting. You don't know if they're going to produce fruit or not. Sometimes you can see it. Sometimes you may never see it. This little man for 40 years never saw one soul. But at least a, probably 146,000 or more would be attributed to those that he won to Jesus. Ask God to give you a heart. Ask God to give us a heart. I know, I know this is our pastor's heart, that the harvest would come in. It's crazy world out there, but it's really, in some ways, it's ripe for revival. Because it's going to be so dark that your little light is going to shine even brighter. Why, why are you still able to cope with all this stuff? Why are you still able to do, do what you do? Well... It's because Jesus lives on the inside, and he gives me the grace to do it. He'll give you the grace to do it. Just surrender your life to him. Surrender your heart to him.
Father. Your heart is broken for souls. We can't win everybody, but we can win somebody. We can obey you, that's for sure. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord God, to overcome any fear. Help us, Lord God, to go on in spite of rejection. Because the truth is, folks, if someone doesn't go, if someone doesn't reach them somehow, they will spend eternity. Are you listening? They will spend eternity forever, forever, forever. We can't even imagine it. They will spend eternity forever separated from God. I don't know what to do, Brother Dennis. Pray. Pray and get the plan of God. Pray and get the wisdom of God. I don't know what to do. Ask God. He'll show you what to do. He'll teach you what to do. There's, there's all kinds of instruction. I'll close with this. In New York City, there was a bus that got hit by a car. And the bus burst into flames. And the people inside were trapped. They were beating on the windows trying to get out. But it, it, it happened so fast and the flame was so hot. The people literally burned up in the bus. It was so bad, so horrible a sight that one man who was looking on from the sidewalk had a heart attack and died. But soon, it was all over. All over. But you know what, church? Hell is never over. Eternity is never over. It just goes on and on and on and on. I have the power, the potential through the Lord to change someone's destiny. I have that potential. Lord, help me to be sensitive. Help me to be sensitive. My wife asked that lady that question, a lady that is in one of the stores here in town. She said, if you died tonight, do you know you'd go to heaven? And the woman didn't say anything, but she called. My wife gave her her phone number. She called, I don't know, several days later and said, can I meet with you? And we met her. My wife went up to Brahms and met her. And She said, why did you ask me that question? I haven't been able to sleep. God will show you a way. God will show you what to do and how to do it. And always do it in love. But don't be afraid to tell people the truth. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Pastor Angel, do you want to say anything to close us out, sir? Take hands with somebody beside you there if you could. Let's, let's pray that God will help us to be a soul-winning people.